Welcome to Between the Reads, where we shine a spotlight on some of the most talented black authors in the industry to discuss their works of fiction and the inspirations behind them. Each episode, we'll dive into the rich and diverse world of literature, exploring everything from historical fiction to romance and speculative fiction to YA and beyond. Tune in as we celebrate the voices of black authors and the power of storytelling. Are you ready, booze and bros? Then sit back. Relax, and let's get to it. Jessica Cage is an international award-winning and USA Today best-selling author of speculative fiction and urban fantasy novels. Publishing since 2010, Jessica made a name for herself in indie publishing through consistent efforts and organic growth of her platform. The author of 35 fiction novels and 18 short stories published in different anthologies, she continues to produce stories that give representation to marginalized communities in fantasy landscapes. Jessica added a branch to her career to focus more on helping other authors reach their goals in 2021 with the start of her Caged Writers Group, where she offers guidance for new writers and the launch of her first shared world book collection, Rise of the Elites, which gave five authors direct access to Jessica's audience in a meaningful and lasting way. Jessica, welcome to Between the Reads. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you're welcome. It's so wonderful that you're here and I'm crushing on your earrings right now. That's so oh, cute. You. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell our readers what A Corruption of Gilded Ashes is all about? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Um, so it, uh, Corruption to Go to Ashes is a part of the second shared world collection that I launched where each book is written by a different author. Um, and we all wrote together in a world that's governed by a goddess who punishes anyone who hurts the world that she's given them. Right. So she's like, I created this little world and it's my baby. And then all of you people popped up on it okay right. and she's like I care more about this world than I do about y'all okay <laughs> so she makes them enter what is called the eldest trials which is a test of the goddess if they do anything to hurt her planet they have to be tested and then if they fail they will be cursed by the goddess okay um so each book in the series or the collection focuses on a different civilization or species in this world that is now being called uh, to this test by the goddess. Um, my book, A Corruption of Good Ashes, focuses on the griffin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the land griffin are one of the oldest species to ever exist. They're, you know, been around, they big, they big, they're powerful, mm -hmm. but they're doing things in a way that everyone knows the goddess is not about to be happy about this. You know, you're doing too much, right. you know? <laughs> and people mm -hmm. don't know that they have a secret sister species um, the water griffin who live in the protected waters under their island. Mm -hmm. And this book is about the water griffins being like, you know what? We don't agree with what you're doing. We want to separate ourselves from you. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to make our own impact on this world, right? Listen, uh, we need a goddess like this to come up in here. <laughs> There's because so many things happening. <laughs> there are so many things happening Don't right now. <laughs> we need a goddess like this to come be like, come on, we going, y'all going into Eldritch Trials. Yeah, and that's, you know what, that was me just looking around the world we live in. It's like, what if there was an entity that would step in, right. you know what I mean, and take care of what we're dealing with here. Because obviously humans, we <laughs> we don't know what we're doing. And we're letting mm -hmm. the people who have power make these decisions that are literally this hurting the world that we live in, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's like, what if we did have a goddess or an entity that was like, this will not do. <laughs> Y'all got to get it together or get off this planet. And I think that entity would see that it's a certain group of people that lack melanin <laughs> that's starting all this shit. We would be we yeah. fine. Going across the world just to cause and devastation. <laughs> All over the planet. <laughs> All over the planet. <laughs> so this book, in a big way, is about Malway and the growth process she goes through as she sheds her mother's fears and finds the courage to live the way she wants to live, even though she's a princess. Yeah. That was a very unique way of presenting the theme of challenging societal norms. I'd like to unpack that a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. I. So we always have like 
the the princess who is going to come into power, the princess, you know, who has been raised a certain way and coiffed and, you know what I mean? And they're mm-hmm. just trying to, like, stake their claim as the new queen. Like, I feel like I've seen that story so many times. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to talk about the princess that knows she's not next in line to be queen. Mm-hmm. You know, I have some responsibilities, but ultimately, I, I have the the space to live my own life, but she still has the weight of the royal family on her shoulder. Mm -hmm. And now she has a mother because she is slightly different than everyone else Mm -hmm. who is overprotective because of those differences. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So it it became a a thing of like her being brave enough to stand up to her mother and say, I don't, this is the future that I want for myself. But then also dealing with her own self identity issues that having a mother that protected her and, basically told her not to be herself for her Mm -hmm. own fears. Like now I have to work through my own identity crisis that has been rooted in this, right? Right. All while trying to then, you know, do something for my people and for the greater good Mm -hmm. of this, you know, whole country worth of, you know, water griffins. So there's so many layers of what Maui has to dig through, the grief, the loss, you know, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of (laughs) death and devastation in this book. Um, So there's some heavy themes that also comes with her just trying to to get through it all. Listen, I'm going to tell y'all, you are going to be in your feelings in this book. (laughs) Because the theme that just kind of drives her story of, of, uh, you know, authenticity and I'm trying not to get ahead of myself because I have questions but the authenticity and questioning your motives and carrying other people's expectations and all of these things that we deal with as people every day Mm -hmm. she has to learn how to deal with it in a very profound way that doesn't just affect her but it affects her whole society yes yeah. And I, when I tell you I was in my feelings, I was highlighting stuff in my Kindle like, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> like, uh, for instance, staying on Malway for a moment, I want to talk about this quote. She made herself small and refused to show the world her true self for fear of how they would respond to her. Yeah. And I, that's something that I feel like comes from being a black woman in the world that we live in, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and having conversations with other women who have been in these positions where it's like, you know, I know that I can do so much more. I know that I can bring so much more to the table. And I, my, my background is in corporate America. As a black woman in corporate America, there has been plenty of times where I found myself shrinking myself or silencing myself, even though I knew better. You know what I mean? Right. Even though I knew the answer, the solution is right here and y'all just circling it, right? Mm-hmm. But because of that, you know, stigma that comes with being bold, but what's, you know, speaking up, you mm-hmm. know, you become the black woman with the attitude, the, the angry, angry black woman. Black woman. Yes. yes, right? Mm-hmm. So it's that, it, it's that energy, the same type of energy of being like, yeah, I know a better way to do this. Yeah, I know that, you know, I'm different and I have a unique perspective, but also I don't want that to come back on me as a negative because people don't understand or because this is the way a princess is supposed to be. So if I'm not actually inside of those, you know, um, guidelines that everyone thinks is is fitting of a princess, then there's a problem, right? Right. Um, So, and it's also, again, from her mother, telling her pretty much her entire life to Mm -hmm. not be as bold and as beautiful and as, you know, big of a personality as she really is because her mother was afraid of the same thing. Yep. Yep. Her mother, you know, it's, it's, I'm trying to look through my questions because I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but (laughs) you know, the, the, the thing where she, um, where she talks to her mother It's just, it's this beautiful moment where she has to, before the elder trials begin, Mm -hmm. she's told that she needs to write a letter to someone that she loves. And she ends up picking someone other than her mother, but she goes to her mother and says, you know, I need to say some things to her face and I need to see her face and I need to see her reaction. And she goes to her mom And she tells her mom that, you know, you put 
all of your fears onto me. You know, you projected them onto the me, onto me to the point where I was living in fear, you know, and I was too scared. I, I couldn't do, you didn't allow me to do things because of your fears and your fears limited my life. And she just kind of lays everything out for her mother. Yeah. But she's surprised because her mother actually just listens and doesn't try to defend what she did. You know, she doesn't try to justify it. She apologizes for it. And in that, several things happen. One, she's able to go into the trials with as clear a mind as she can have, you know, with that weight lifted off of her shoulders. Um, but she also realizes that her mother is a person and that her mother had reasons yeah. for doing the things that she did. And she wasn't doing them to be malicious or to try to purposely keep her from living. She just had this little frail baby, you know, and she was trying to protect her and just talk a little bit about that. The way that she kind of, she, that I think that's the first time she saw her mother as human and not just her mother. Yeah. Um, and so, okay. So just in representing that conversation and relationship between them, I didn't want it to be like the expected knockdown, you know, argument because the queen in herself is the very is she's very understanding she's very logical right so it didn't make sense to me that she wouldn't be receptive of what her daughter is saying mm -hmm. to her you know what i mean mm -hmm. like just to have you know the drama there i could have been like oh and they argue da, da, da. but for the characters that presented themselves the way that they were built this is a very level-headed woman okay mm -hmm. and she's okay with accepting it in the ways that she may not be you know, perfect. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, I'm flawed. Okay. I see that in my bag, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted that to be, and on, on top of that, she knows what her daughter is about to face. I'm not about to have you upset at me and, right. you know, take Knowing your head I out the die. game. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and then if you don't come back now, I got to wonder, well, maybe if I would have just been, you know, nice about what she said, mm -hmm. um, this would have been okay. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just that it's that moment. I feel like all of us come to uh, the realization that our parents, no matter how great or you know terrible they were at it, they were doing the best they can they could with what they had. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think if you go to therapy, if you grow, and you you learn, and you do your own inner work, you one day you will look at your parents and say you were human. Mm -hmm. And you did the best you could. Mm -hmm. I know I've had that moment. I've talked to my friends who've had that moment. Like, no, you weren't the greatest at it, but mm -hmm. you did the best you could. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it also comes from like my mother. I am able to have those type of conversations with my mother and she is receptive to it. And so every time I see these stories where it's like they try to talk to their parents and their parents is like freaking out and it's a big blowout that's not my lived reality. You know what I mean? Like, and I wanted to represent those of us who do have parents who are, you know, open to hearing what you have to say. Do they like it? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Do they agree? Maybe not, but they're not going to like <laughs> tear you down because you've spoken up about something that affected you. Right. This is a healthy. And I think that was one of the things, like, I feel like this is one of the healthiest families that mm -hmm. I've written, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they are a close knit, you know, family, the relationship between her and her mother, her and her sisters, her and her father, they're all just so close. And it didn't make sense for me to break that bond that they clearly had, you know what I mean? Right. Just to add some tension or drama to the story. Right. Right. And, and I love that her mother, even though she's a queen, even though she's, you know, an adult, when her, when her daughters come to her and say, um, no, you not, you just said we need to be independent and then you go sit there and let them be the ones to put in the names for the trial. They were like, uh, no, that goes against everything that you're trying to do. And her yeah. mother could have just put her foot down and been like, y'all don't know what you're talking about. I'm the queen. I'm older. But she didn't. She just listened to all three of them and she was like, and so you all feel this way. And they're like, yep. And she was like, <laughs> mm, well, I guess I learned something here. Right. You know, and she wasn't, she didn't say because, you know, she's older and knows better. She took a moment yeah. and paused in that grief that she was dealing with and realized that that grief was keeping her from making a better decision that's really going to help them. Yeah. And I like that she was, that she was humble enough to do that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I have one of those parents who's <laughs> like, I'm older and I don't care how old you are. I'm older and so I know better. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> just because you're older don't mean you know better. I'm just saying I can be right about things too. I'm just because I'm your child does not mean I am a child. Exactly. Yeah. And I need you to hear my adult person speaking and and not, you know, belittle it or dismiss it because you still see me as your child. Yeah. And I love that that was not the dynamic here because yeah, it could like have been said, because I... she was, she was very sheltered. So her mother could have been like, look, you ain't lived your life. You don't know nothing, but she didn't. Yeah. Because I mean, even though Maui was sheltered, she was still educated. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like her mother made sure she knew how to take care of herself, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, yeah, you can't be out there with everybody doing everything, but you're right. going to be smart. You're going to know the world. You're going to understand because you are still potentially a queen in the making, you know, even though you're not next in line there, if a, a certain tragic case of events happen, right. you're next in line, you know, right. so you still have to be prepared in the eventuality that you have to take on that role. Mm-hmm. And I love how her dad would sneak her off. Like when her mama was just doing too much, she was like, come on. <laughs> Right. We're gonna go have some fun. She, she, she. <laughs> Your mama tripping right now. We gonna go go, live go have some fun. <laughs> and I feel like most of the fathers in that world were like that. The mothers were so much more strict. Mm-hmm. Like the little girl in the beginning running around cursing mm-hmm. and the <laughs> father's just like, It's fine. And the mom was like, You can't laugh. <laughs> Like the child is cursing in front of the in front of the princess. We get screaming and running, cursing. He's like, she's just a kid. She's a word. Herself. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. I loved it. I loved it. So this is a beautiful world you've built with Uman and land and water griffins and the forge. And the, the, is it the Walai? Because I was reading the, the pronunciations, but I was like, it's, just, it's it Wali or Walai? It's Walai. Walai, yes. Walai. okay. <laughs> so tell us about the world building techniques, techniques that you used to bring the hidden underwater kingdom and the land Griffin society to life. Uh, well, first I had to just be sure to remember that they're sharing this world, but they're two separate entities, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the cultures, the practices, like the values of these two people are different. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the same simply because they kind of branch from the same being, right? They became, they just, they're sisters, right? Mm-hmm. But um, they're also in their own right, living in two separate worlds, mm-hmm. especially for the water griffin. Like they're so isolated from everyone, like their cultures, their practices, their magics, their techniques of mm-hmm. living and navigating this underwater world um, was one thing, right? And then this land griffins who are superficial and everything's, you know, gilded and, and golden and shiny and technology, you know. So building this world, knowing that the Walai people are... Um, the water griffins are very still heavily tied to culture and magic and connection to the goddess. And Mm -hmm. then the land griffins are technology. Like they don't really even fly anymore. They got planes. You know what I mean? Like they are so tech driven and because they've started to lose connection to the goddess in their, their natural magic, they have Mm -hmm. to find other ways to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I was able to put more magic and fantasy in the underwater, creating all these creatures and, right. you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Dealing with like how they light up their space at night because mm-hmm. we need light, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So all of these things I was able to just have so much fun with. And then on the land, it's like, okay, we got to be more structured, more industrialized. Mm-hmm. Um, they have, you know, formality about what color you can wear, de- depending on right. what rank you are in their society. Like they're mm-hmm. very superficial, right? Mm-hmm. So it was very, I don't know, my mind was going back and forth from this like whimsical fantasy place to like this regimented, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a little bit like whiplash. Um, but I like, I really had to sit down and first think about the values of each one of these individual societies Mm -hmm. and then where they overlap and how they are tied. Right. And then once I have their value set down, then I can build up the the societies. Right. Right. 
And the dynamics of the caste system with the forge, where individuals are assigned roles and status based on the colors of their robes, Mm -hmm. it draws interesting parallels to historical and contemporary discussions about race relations in the United States, where people have been categorized and treated differently based on their racial backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Now, was that something you did on purpose? Or was that something that as you wrote it, you were just like, hmm, there's some problems um, here. <laughs> or is that just it something was, I just pulled out the air when I was reading? You know, it sounds like <laughs> that question where they're like, the author made the curtain blue. What did that mean in the curtain? The author was on the other side, like my favorite color is blue. It's blue. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> it's like, I don't think I was thinking as deep as that. I just knew that I wanted to represent the ways in which they had become more superficial and Mm -hmm. and um where status was important right and in a Mm -hmm. system where people care about status Mm -hmm. they want to see your status right there's like um kind of it's kind of the same in Wallai where it's like if they are full out in their full griffin form all the time they're Mm -hmm. one of the strongest they're one of the oldest it's a it's a level of you know um being not better than but just like i'm showing you that i'm strong i i I belong in the position i'm in right Mm -hmm. it takes a lot to stay in that form Mm -hmm. whereas on the land griffin side they have people who are in all types of forms but visibly speaking like they're they're not as connected to their magic so they're not going to be able to walk around like that all the time you know what i mean like so now we have to come up with a new way Mm-hmm. to show our status and now this status isn't coming from our connection to the goddess but mm-hmm. from what the the royal family has decided gives us status in this world right so there's mm-hmm. kind of like the the monk so to speak he was given a higher status even though he was born into a lower family mm-hmm. he was given a higher status because of what he's done mm-hmm. the former champion again given a higher status because okay you went into the test of the goddess and you survived and we're right. all still here because of you right? right so it was just like how do we how do you show that ranking system so to speak um, in two different worlds where one is really talking about like connection to nature and, and the goddess and being one with yourself. Mm-hmm. And then another side is like, we don't know how to do that no more. So we got to come up with another way. Right? right. Which again becomes more, that's where you see the parallels, right. To our world, because now it's not about your connection. It's about what family you're born into. You know what I mean? It's about what area you're born into, which you don't have any control over, Mm -hmm. but you could be born and, and build that connection to the goddess and strengthen yourself and get a higher ranking through your own individual process. Mm -hmm. But you can't really do that. Right. (laughs) You you know, your mother was over here, so I'm over here too, you know? So that's where the parallels come from, but it wasn't, um, intentionally that it was just me trying to uh, showcase you know how they care so much about the status and the ranking mm-hmm. um and even in will is like they don't really care about that you know what right. i mean it's something right. that the council members do because they want to represent it to their people but their people not gonna throw stones at them if they don't <laughs> you know what i mean no 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 yeah. no no and i love that i love that you know the will that they are They still honor the land. They're still connected to the land. They still, you know, have reverence for, you know, living things, you know, and they still stop and appreciate the beauty. Yeah. Whereas the land griffins, they're so, they've become so advanced that they've forgotten how to honor and appreciate the simple things of life and how fragile life is. And we see that they forgot that with this big environmental incident that happens that doesn't affect them per se, but deeply affects, you know, the water griffins. And they, when it happens, they can't even take the time to you know send someone down to say is everything okay and yeah. honey that scene between uh valier and 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 was it uh helena i think yes. the queen yeah <laughs> the queen <laughs> when she was like 
Listen here. <laughs> yeah, she she lost all of that royal training and went out the window. <laughs> the black girl came out and was like, oh, like, I'm okay. Out of your mess. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, y'all up here cutting up, cutting into the island. Stuff is, is wrecked below, and y'all ain't got you know, just an ounce of, of, of empathy to come down here yeah. and, or send a representative to say, are y'all okay? My bad. You know, we did this. We going to help fix. No, y'all just. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, they're so disconnected. They don't even realize like, like we're fine up here. So whatever, there is a right. whole nother <laughs> group of people, whole but because society. they're not on my status, what are you talking about? They don't have the right robes on. I don't care right. about what they're, you know, going through. So, yeah. But even though they see this, I guess this is just the militant me because she's like, you take our stuff, our ideas, but you can't check on us. So they don't want to acknowledge this whole other society that's down here, yeah. but they're using all of their stuff. Colonizers. And you're benefiting from it, but you're, you're not even giving them credit. Yeah, Colonizers. Mm -hmm. See, this is why I'm making all these connections. <laughs> <laughs> Those land griffins are some colonizers. They're stealing people's <laughs> ideas. They're stealing people's, you know, all the, all, everything that makes their society run. They got it from the water griffins. And y'all going to sit there and, and, and call, wreak all that havoc and not even take a minute to say, dang. Y'all like right? Yeah, like y'all good. <laughs> you bring y'all up out the water while we try and fix this. Like nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Trifling. Trifling. <sighs> so when Maui is picked for the Eldritch Trials, Jerem tells her that it isn't enough to want to win the trial that she has to be honest with herself about what her motives are or she will fail. How does his advice highlight the broader theme of self-awareness and authenticity in achieving your goals? Ooh, that's a deep question. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> that's how I do. <laughs> I think that honestly, like, if you're not honest with yourself about your reasoning for doing something, you're mm -hmm. never going to get the outcome you really want, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that there is this negative, like, stigma about wanting things for self, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where Malway was, like, you know, tripping up because she's like, yeah, I want to do this for my people, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, but there's also something in there that you want for yourself. And it's mm -hmm. okay for you to want that. That's mm -hmm. motivating for you to do it. And if what you want for yourself is going to ultimately benefit other people, awesome. You know what right. I mean? Right. But it's like people in general, these are general terms, right. um, are not aware enough of their own motivations, their own like genuine desires and the reasons that drive them to really get to where they want to go, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're set and it, I feel like what we say out loud the universe hears and delivers, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're only saying partial truths, and you know mm -hmm. what I mean, you're only gonna get the partial deliverance of what you're mm -hmm. looking for, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, yes, I do what I do because it drives, is what I want. I want to be a writer. I want to do these things. Mm -hmm. But alongside of that, I do want to help other people. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the end of the day, when I'm writing, it's because that's in my soul was what I feel like I have to do for me. Right. right. And I'm happy that it helps and motivates other people <laughs> along the way, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to sit here and, and tell the world, like I always wanted to be helping other writers. Like that was not, right. when I first started doing this, it's because this is what I wanted for me. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then I saw ways that I could pass that along in the future to other people and help others. Right. Mm -hmm. But Malway was so focused on I'm doing this for my people. I'm the princess. I have to prove this to my, you know, it's like, okay, but what do you want for you? Because right. when you go in there, that's the goddess knows, even if you don't know, mm -hmm. the goddess knows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what's going to be confronting you when you walk in there, because right. she knows, even if you, if you are trying to lie to yourself about what's going on, you know, right. you right. got to unburden yourself with the guilt of being selfish in some moments mm -hmm. um, in order to really get what you're trying to get. 
Right. And I love that it gave it kind of, you know, Jerem gave her permission to be selfish. He was like, it's OK. Being yeah. selfish is not a bad thing. Like it, if if it's if it, if your selfishness is all consuming to the point where you're only thinking about yourself. Yes, that's bad. But he is like, you are a self. So yeah. you're going to be selfish. You have to take care of you while you're taking care of other people. Yeah. You know, and he gave her that permission to say, yeah, it's OK there. You have you have selfish motives. And this fool, he he's mad because he didn't get picked and he ain't even being honest with why he wants to really right. be <laughs> in the trials. Everybody else see it but him. Jared right. went off. He was like, everybody he's see it to- but him. <laughs> He's trying to do a whole uprising, but he's not going to tell everybody that. No, no. He's going to sit there and act like, you know, oh, yeah, I, I understand why I wasn't picked. And, you know, I don't like it, but, you know, I'm like, yeah. bullshit. You, you yeah. mad. You mad. <laughs> <laughs> you mad and you just need to admit that you mad. You mad, yes. You know, Maybe you would have got picked if you admitted it to yourself, you know. Exactly. He might have got picked. But the goddess was like, uh-huh, I see what you're trying to do. Nope, you ain't getting picked. Yeah. Sit down. <laughs> So the concept of unity and shared judgment between the land griffins and the water griffins is a central theme to the book. So how do the actions of the land griffins symbolize the idea that the consequences of one group's choices can affect, can affect an entire interconnected ecosystem? Ooh. <laughs> she came with a good question. I, um. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I honestly just believe that. So again, this this whole project came out of me just kind of looking at the world around us mm-hmm. and and seeing how, honestly, as a whole, we're individual. Like we think of self and right. self only, and we often miss the bigger picture, right? Mm-hmm. And that's that's the land griffins thinking mm-hmm. of self, right? Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, and if you know anything about my work, there's always an important tree, right? There's a tree. Okay. Now we didn't have a tree, so to speak, in this story, but the island itself, if you think about the way it's described, the connection, the bar- the whole branch the, between, the fountain, it's one big tree, the right? The is kind of you the know? tree too, yeah. Yes. <laughs> So it's like, this is a like basically an underwater tree. The water griffins are at the roots and mm-hmm. the land griffins are at the top, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like that connectivity to them, they're two separate things and they don't see, like the water griffins see it all day. It's mm-hmm. their part of the world. They see where it's connected. Mm-hmm. But because they're up here on their individualized mindset, thinking about how we can make everything pretty and get status, Mm -hmm. they forgotten that root is beneath them. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And so they really move and navigate as if what they're doing doesn't affect anybody else but themselves, as long as they're happy, they're comfortable, they're good, right? But there's always a trickle. There's always somebody else that's going to be affected by your words, your actions. You know, it might not even be the water griffins. What Mm -hmm. they did in the beginning of the, the, the story will mm-hmm. go on to impact so many others throughout that world. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But again, we're focusing on the connectivity of these two people, right? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, we're all human, but we've put ourselves into these little bubbles. But at the end of the day, we're all human. We all need this world to be mm-hmm. healthy and here. And what mm-hmm. oil spill happens over here is going to affect the water that they're drinking over there. Right. It's going to affect the plants that they're growing over there. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I wanted to showcase how someone could be blinded to the fact that they're doing these things. You know what I mean? And there's all these people in, in, in Forge that are just like, man, nah, whatever. Like, right. right. <laughs> no one else, not one of them threw up a hand like, hey, what are we doing? Not right. a single person, right? Because they have become this individualized cloud chasing society. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Which is what we, I feel like on earth have right. become. Right. Uh, <laughs> so it's just, it was, it, it was me trying to um, showcase like the blindness to that, but then also having people come and smack them in the face and say, look at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like this, this is not okay. But then also having people in the Royal family who were becoming more cognizant and looking out onto the world and understanding like the older generation, Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
they messing up, right? And, and trying to showcase where generations can also impact the change and hopefully get them back to a place where they understand the connectivity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, it's, I hate it, but I also understand it how, you know, the person that the goddess chooses to do the trial, if they lose, then there's a hundred year curse upon their people. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. but that's not fair because that's one person that's going in there to fight. But, you know, and it was even said in the book, like life isn't fair. But again, that just shows you the interconnectedness because you have one person that's representing you. Mm -hmm. And if that person does it, like you're all in this together, like this one person is going, but they're, you're all in this thing together. Yeah. You're all basically fighting in this trial, even though it's just her, because the and outcome that's why is going to affect all of you. Yeah, and that's why the water griffins <laughs> wanted to separate, right? Because they understand that in the goddess' eyes, like we are all one. We're mm-hmm. all griffins, right? Mm-hmm. The goddess doesn't have yet a, a distinction between the two yet, right? Mm-hmm. Like we need to have our own space in this world right. apart from you because mm-hmm. y'all not doing what y'all need to do. Because y'all right? crazy, y'all crazy. Up, y'all and we not about way. to be getting no curses because of y'all. Because y'all acting crazy, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so in this world, each species has their own Hasking Stone, which is how they know the goddess mm-hmm. is calling upon them, right? Mm-hmm. So. They like, we got to get our own stone. We can't share right, stuff. Right. <laughs> it's like, God is listen here. Okay. <laughs> we have to get away from y'all because we, we're not trying to do this. But again, it's that thing where it's like, your actions are going to impact every single person. Like mm-hmm. even the griffins that don't live in forage anymore, you know, if they right. move to the other side of the world, if we fail, they get ripped up with us. They don't right. matter. They, <laughs> everybody know? gonna get it. Everybody's <laughs> getting it. Yes. <laughs> it's like this is an island. Y'all don't understand that. This is an island. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard to think like how could you guys have gotten this far away knowing that this right. and you know what I'm saying? Even when we know that there are consequences for our actions, we will push the envelope as far as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. And then try to fix it well. after it's broke. And it's like it's broke now. Yeah, you can't. You can't fix this. Yeah, you know, because and and like you said, and then and some of these consequences are generational because they're gonna be dealing with that explosion that happened for generations. It has Mm -hmm. affected their ecosystem. It has affected the health and the life of 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 the water of of the water griffins. Like yeah, you know, (sighs) huh. They are them land griffins. I was like, can we just, yeah, we need a separate system. I'm glad there's a separate system because <laughs> y'all crazy. I'm going to need y'all yes. to be over there and the goddess can deal with y'all. So when she come calling, be like, uh-uh, you call them. Are we calling us because we ain't do it. Yeah. We ain't do it. We, yeah. It was, it was not us. <laughs> because the goddess is like that parent. She's like that, you know, that black parent when, when she come upstairs with the bell, everybody getting it. Like everybody get it. <laughs> I told y'all to be quiet. Y'all didn't be quiet. Everybody getting it. Everybody getting it. And you got the one person in the court like, I was quiet. Like, nah, everybody I was getting the book. it. <laughs> she like, nah, I don't care. Everybody getting it. Cause you was up here reading the book and didn't come down and tell me that yeah, they'd be allowed. Yeah, going on. Yeah. You didn't hold them accountable. So now you in it too. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. They're fair now. That's why we need our own separate thing. <laughs> <laughs> so this book is part of the Eldritch Trial series, which is a shared world book collection, and it includes your book, and then A Dance of Blood and Destiny by K.R.S. McIntyre, A Seeker of Honor and Redemption by A.L. Riley, A Blaze of Spirit and Dreams by D.L. Howard, A Drop of Ink and Obsidian by Kish Knight, Song of Sin by E.M. Lacey, and Sins of the Serpent King by, is it Delisha Jenkins? Delisha. Delisha Jenkins. Okay, almost had it, almost had it. <laughs> so tell us more about this project, how you pick these authors to participate, and what kind of guidelines did you give them to, to write their stories? Um, so I pick the people that I want to work with, the people that I see out here doing it for themselves and showing up every day and promoting themselves. Um, it's just like, I like the way you write. I like the way you flow. Let's work together. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I thought about doing like open calls and submissions and te- I was like, I ain't gonna do all that. Honestly, I was like, <laughs> that's too much work. That's a whole lot of work I ain't trying to do. <laughs> I'm just gonna ask the people who I right. like and I see them doing it. There's, I mean, and I'm always collecting names of authors that I'm like, well, I would like to write. And I just write their name down in my little notebook. And then when I come up with another project, I reach out, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really just, you know, me looking out, looking out and seeing like, oh my God, you're amazing. I really wanna be able to, um, in some way have an impact to help you grow mm-hmm. and continue to put your work out there. And like I said, through these shared worlds, these books are out there forever. So people right. will enter mine and hopefully go through the others and they will find new new authors to love, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as the process, I do. So I'm a pantser by heart, which means I'm not plotting right. nothing yeah, now, right? I don't even build my world. Whatever comes, start. comes. <laughs> yes. But in instances like this, I have to sit down and build a world before I can invite other people in, right? So mm-hmm. typically when I invite them in, I do have loose guidelines about like how many words, the style, you know, compare uh, comp titles that we're trying to look, you know, mm-hmm. the themes, like all of that stuff that you need to like understand the audience we're writing for, you know, and the world that we're writing in, right? But I mm-hmm. tell them specifically, write this book the way you write your books. Don't right. try to write this book to sound like me. Mm-hmm. That's not the point of this. It's so that people can come into this and learn your style, right? Mm-hmm. And then if they like your style, they'll go read your other books. But if they read a book by you that sounded like me and then they go to your other books, they come like, who wrote these? You know what I mean? Right, right, right. <laughs> right. Like, so like I what want... I'm here for. <laughs> exactly, right. And so... I create the the world as a as a high level world, right? Mm-hmm. But inside this world, we all have to create our own little cultural cultures, right? So it's like okay. each book is like traveling to a new country in this world and learning their history, their practices, their religion, their society build because it's kind of like going from the US to China to India to right. whatever, right? We, you know, you're on the same planet, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but you're gonna come into different people, different pra- practices, different languages, mm-hmm. um, and so this process from start to finish is about a year and a half to two years for wow. each one that I do. So it's not like I'm saying like, oh, come in and write and let's go. You know what I mean? Like I'll see mm-hmm. you and we'll publish whatever. Like we have in Zoom calls, we're building and talking about the languages and mm-hmm. timelines, and mm-hmm. you know, making sure that. If you say this particular plant does this in your book, it got to do the same thing in my book. If I say these these waters are protected and can't nobody go in there, they can't go to your book and y'all swimming up in there. You know what I mean? Y'all just having a grand old day. You know what I'm saying? If you use a creature in your book, I might think that creature is cool and want to use it in my book. So stuff like that we have and we build the overall like world bible together Mm -hmm. right so Mm -hmm. i create the world in a general sense Mm -hmm. um talking about like high level tech magic you know structures society like you know Mm -hmm. and then they get to create their own pocket of that world Mm -hmm. and we just track it all (laughs) to make Mm -hmm. sure that is making sense and it's like if you created a creature or you are like no one can write about a griffin in their book without talking to me first to make mm-hmm. sure that they're not representing the Griffins or making them do something that they're not supposed to do or whatever, right? right? Mm-hmm. So you might have them waving in a certain way that is culturally horrifying for mm-hmm. them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So things of that nature, like we had to make sure that moving from book to book, the readers got a consistent, like overarching world. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Even though obviously the style of writing is going to be different. You know, the tone, mm-hmm. like, but you should still feel like you're in in the same world. Still in the same world. So there are microcosms within this larger macrocosm. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So now you are, are you still an indie author? I know you started out as an indie author. You're still an indie author. I'm still indie, yes. (laughs) And you are very successful. You are a USA Today bestselling author, which is rare to see an indie author make that list. 35 novels. 18 short stories. How did you do it? Because, I mean, you've been on the scene for 13 years, and in a way, that's a long time, but in a way, in the publishing world, that's not a long time. So how did you do it? Uh, A lot of crying, though. (laughs) 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 Uh, Just being consistent and taking advantage of the opportunities and the knowledge that's out there. Um, I often think about, like, the first, I don't know, five or six years of my career, I know what I, I was just flailing, right? 
Um, so I started publishing December of 2010. And then literally for the first five or six years, I was just, I don't know, just throwing stuff out there. Let's see if it sticks, you know? Mm-hmm. And then one day I sat down, I was like, listen, honey, <laughs> we want to do this for real. We got to get for real. We got to right. get a strategy. We got to, you know, learn some things, strengthen some things. Mm-hmm. And so I started, you know, just kind of re uh, reevaluating how I was approaching my career because I'm like, I want this to be the career. I want this to be the thing that I do. I don't want to always have to have another job or whatever. I want this to be it for me, Um, but I can't do it if I don't have any strategy. I don't have a brand. There's nothing. So I built a brand. I built a website. I built, I recovered all of my books. So now people will see my covers and they know that's a Jessica Cage book, what I have. And I've had people say that to me and I was like, yes, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that's me what I, you know, (laughs) Um, (laughs) it's working. Like I Um, did And I just, you know, I started reading more about the business side of it and and educating myself on how to be a better writer. Because one of the things I always said is like the next book is always going to be better than the last. I'm always going to be trying to be better and do it better. I didn't go to school for this. You know what I'm saying? Like this is Mm -hmm. the passion that I've had. So I got a a little bit of a gap to make up for on the education side. So I started buying tons of books to teach me how to be better at this on the writing side and on the business side of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a, it's a difficult journey. It is, Mm -hmm. um, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. Um, and I've had so many of my author friends that they ain't in it no more. They was like, girl, I'm tired of this. Like I got to go. And I was just like, okay, I'm gonna just keep on. (laughs) Right, right, right. Keep on going on. And uh, if I see you, I see you. I love you, girl. You know, um, (laughs) and it's, I mean, there are days that I'm just like, Oh Lord, this is a lot of work, but I, I would not be me if I wasn't doing what I do. You know what I mean? Like, I've been storytelling since I was a little kid. I literally started writing stories for my grandmother because I would talk her ear off. You know what I mean? <laughs> She's like, she go, was write, like Girl, go, go write grandma's I'm, story. Right. She would hand me <laughs> and say, go write it down. We'll read it later. And the thing is, she would read it later. Right? Wow. That's the part. She didn't just tell me to do it to shut me up. Mm-hmm. She would actually read those stories or have me read them to her. Mm-hmm. Um and it was so encouraging. And I was like, I just got to keep doing this, you know? Right, right. And so I've it's been in me. And I should have went to school for it. That would have made sense. I should have done that. But I didn't, you know? You grow up poor, you got to you gotta get a, a career that's going to make money, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's being honest with myself about why I wanted to do this, being vulnerable enough to ask for help, which I wasn't for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I'm very much a DIY. I'm not going to ask nobody for no help type of girl, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. but it got to a point where it was like, if you don't ask nobody for some help, you ain't going to be doing this for much longer, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's like building a a community of people who I trust to be honest with me. Honest, not me. You don't got to be brutal, but you can tell me the truth. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Um, and then just having a supportive family and just friends who cheer you on in the days where you're like, I don't know if I could do this. Me and my brother go back and forth having that conversation with mm-hmm. each other because he's an artist. Mm-hmm. So some days I'm like, I don't know if I could do this writing thing no Aww. more. And some days he's like, I don't know if I could do this art thing no more. Mm-hmm. And we're just helping each other push through it. Right. Because we know, like, at our cores, we are creators and this is mm-hmm. what we're here for. So. So. You're making space in the black fantasy world for black people and other people of color. But what was that like when your book hit that USA Today bestselling author list? I cried. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I cried. I was in a car. I actually was in the car outside of my doctor's office Uh in a sling like falling apart when I found out. So how did you find, which book was it for? Um, so it was actually a sh- like an anthology book. Okay. So there were a few of us in it. Okay. Um, and so one of my friends hit me up. I can't even remember it off the top of my who it was. Uh-huh. I just remember one of my friends called me like, girl, they, da, da, da. and I was like, what? And then wow. I looked it up and I was like, there was my name on the list. And I was like, ah. Wow. <laughs> 
Um, and it was just like, it, it, it was amazing. It, it, it was like all the work that we put into that project, it had paid mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was one of those moments where it's like, this is not, this is, this won't be the last, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, this is only the beginning, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would go on to hit bestsellers list over and over and over again after that. And now it's like, I expect it, you know what I mean? Right. Like, it's crazy to say that. Mm-hmm. But it used to be a time where I was like, I didn't expect no bestseller. And now I'm like, okay, when I'm going to get my, right. my bestseller back? <laughs> <laughs> Where's that, you know? Uh, <laughs> and I think that's just like the growth of confidence and just, you know, understanding that mm-hmm. there are people who really look forward to the stories I tell. And I just, I appreciate it so much. You know, the support that I continue to get from my readers is like, Every day I feel like my mind is blown and I'm just, mm. I, I, I'm like, I still feel like that little girl writing stories for her grandmother. So it's just, you know what I mean? Like, mm. And then I'm, I'm blinking. It's like, wow. Like, <laughs> you all, this is like a whole career now. You're not just yeah. writing for grandma anymore. Yes. That's awesome. That's amazing that you get to do that. So I, talk to us a little bit about the Caged Writers Group. Uh, so that actually was born of TikTok. I was on TikTok answering questions. I'd started a series called Books and Bonnets where I would just give tips. And people were like, can we get a space where we can just have access, where we can talk and we can discuss? And so I built a Facebook group and we kicked it off with having, I think like 10 other authors come in and, and field questions and, and answer and talk to these uh, new writers. And then we do writing sessions together. Um, I will admit the last like six months or so, I haven't been as active because I I haven't been active with a lot of stuff. I'm healed from a concussion, Ooh, but goodness. we're planning. Yeah. I, I didn't know they were this intense. I didn't know they could last so long, but my doctor was like, yeah, you probably have another four or six months. I was like, four to six months. <laughs> what? So, but as we're picking back up. We're going to live with concussions all growing up. Like, oh my god! I never had. I was like, this is crazy. Am I? It's, it's like a brain fog. And I was mm-hmm. like, going to my doctor, like, I don't know what's going on. I there was one point where they asked me my name in my date of birth, and I was like, uh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Like, mm-hmm. it, you know. So, but we are. I'm going to be picking up again, launching some new materials for them. We do write sessions together. We do, you know, Q and A's and all this stuff. And it's it's very informal. I tell people like, if you have questions tag me, ask the question. A lot of people are a lot more shy. Most people just slide into my DMs. They don't want to post it in a group, Mm -hmm. but that's fine too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's just, I'm here to answer questions. Cause like I said, at one point I was afraid to even open my mouth to ask for help. Mm -hmm. So if I can be there to, to answer questions, but um, like, that's what I'm here for. I want to do that for you guys. Um, But we are going to start formalizing it a little bit more and creating kind of more of a regiment um, because I am creating course works now for um, my first one will be with the Hurston Wrightford Foundation, oh, wow. where I teach authors how to build their profile through social media, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. because I am stepping into this space of kind of formalizing and doing these type of things, I want that Cage Writers Group to become more of a formal space as well, where mm-hmm. I allow these people to have like early access to certain things and mm-hmm. course works. I'm building journals and things of that nature for authors as well. So, um, all of that came from me just sitting on TikTok and answering questions on my live wow. and then posting these little videos, books and bonnets. I was like, y'all, look, y'all got questions. I'm going to answer them, but I'm not doing my hair for it. That was the whole <laughs> thing. Like, I'm not doing my hair. We're going to sit here. Y'all going to take this bonnet. I ain't putting no bra on. And I'm going to answer your question. We're going to sit here and ask. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nah, I'm not going in there and putting makeup on my face for this. <laughs> What's your question? Right? So it started there. It started there, and it's becoming something else, and I'm just excited for what is coming in the future. Uh, like I said, we're heavily in the planning stage now for 2025. So okay. I mean, 2024. Oh, Lord. What year is Yo, it? Yo, I was about to say, you skipped the whole year there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm I'm blaming some, the people, some people are planning stuff for 2025. I'm like, y'all, I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm planning events and like writing projects, release dates. I have some lined up for 2025 already. It's usually two <sighs> to three years out. So yeah. Ooh, I don't know how to do it. I'm like, y'all, I'm, I'm barely like just starting to get 2024 on my radar for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> 2025 is not even 
a blip on my screen. Not even close. (laughs) Not even close. Not even close. (laughs) So what's next for you in the writing world? I know you have the, this, this, this group that you just mentioned, but what else do you have going on? Um, I am working on some secret projects. Uh, also, uh, launching my series of books inspired by my tic- my TikTok stitch prompt series where I would like stitch and then make a little story. So some of those stories I actually wanted to write full books for. So the first one we'll be releasing next year. It's wow. called I Accidentally Summoned a Demon Boyfriend. A uh, fun, sexy book. All right. And listen. <laughs> Um, and then I also am relaunching a lot of my back catalog. I took it down to do some cleanup. You know, mm-hmm. I think as authors, we often look back to those earlier projects like, oh, Lord, I don't want nobody reading that. Right. And as I have more people coming onto my platform and reading my books, I'm like, y'all cannot read that stuff. <laughs> um, so a lot of that I took down and I'm relaunching that in the next uh, year and a half. So relaunching the old stuff, launching some new stuff. Um yeah, it's a lot awesome. going on. Awesome. Awesome. Well, where can readers find your books? Um, you can find my books on my website at jessicacage.com and in online retailers everywhere. Um, I do offer signed paperbacks and hardcovers from my website. Okay. And where can we find you on social media? I am at J Cage Author on all platforms. I try to make it as easy as possible to find me. Right. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes people have different names on different eighteen different usernames. Don't, do like, no, don't do that. Just, just you know, one, maybe two at best. If one of yes. them is taken, you can't. You know. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have come to the end of our show. Thank you, Jessica, for this book, for being here, sharing your time and talents with me today. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. The questions, you came with some hard hitters. I was like, oh, wait, let me think a minute. That's what I do. I dig deep. I dig deep. I love it. I truly enjoyed the book. I enjoyed the message. You you was stepping on my toes a little bit. I was like, okay, Jessica, I ain't coming here for all this. I came in here to read a story. I ain't coming here to learn no life lessons. What you doing? <laughs> And y'all know how I do at the end of every show. I like to leave you with a quote. And today it comes from the late Dorothy West, a black American novelist of the Harlem Renaissance. And she said, to know how much there is to know is the beginning of learning to live. Until next time, y'all, you know what to do. Grab a book and read. And I'm out. Thank you for lending me your ear today. If you've enjoyed this independent podcast, you can help me continue to shine the light on black authors and their stories by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash between the reads or by giving a one-time gift at www.kofi.com slash between the reads podcast. That's ko ficom slash between the reads podcast. Tune in next time for another great episode.